All right. Um, there we go. All right. So I did look at everybody's um, questions from the quiz, even though. Um, Alexi and Rob, it looked like you were able to answer some of the questions. Were you just guessing off of what we did in class, or were you able to see the figures when you went back inside? So uh, it was like locked for like a day and a half. I actually kept it going, and then I uh, crushed it, and then it showed up. So it just looks like it was that one attempt, but that attempt was like two days. Right. And the other the other thing that's weird about it is is I did get some um, some feedback. That's like I, I think I mentioned in lab. I got the email while we were in lab that has to do with the fact that I hit import from two different courses and they're kind of conflicting with each other and that it's a bug. Um, Canvas is aware of it, but there's no um, fix to it. So, um, but I still went through and I made it zero to all, all points for everybody on that one. Um, so let me know if it looks like it's affecting your grade negatively. It shouldn't be, it, but it's still, I still had to go through and because you submitted it before I changed the points on the questions, there might be some weirdness there because I had to say zero out of three or zero out of four, um, even though the quiz was already out of zero. So if, if it looks weird that way, just let me know and we'll make sure that that, I hesitate to just delete the assignment because I'm gonna need it next year. And it's it's a big pain to rewrite those questions, remember what I had here before and that, that kind of stuff. So I'd like to leave it. On there, if I can just zero out the points. And what's it zero out of zero? Zero out of zero. Perfect. And it shouldn't affect your grade in any way. Um, it makes this zero out of zero. Zero out of zero. Keep that. <laughs> the limit as x approaches zero. All right. Um, I did actually come up with a good um, example of, say, pair of electrons. I'm not sure if I'd say it's moved more than once because, again, they're not physically moving. Um, but if you happen to have a pair of pi or a pair of electrons in between two different pi bonds, then that that pair of electrons could create two different resonance structures. So, which would make it impossible three different resonance structures using the same pair of electrons. Um, So for instance, if you had something like lone pair that's allylic to two different pi bonds, there's a resonance structure where the lone pair moves this way to give you To give you this resonance structure, and then there's going to be the same structure the other direction as well. Right? So, and that's one that is going to look a little bit weird because you almost can't get to it directly from the second resonance structure. It's going to be a lot simpler to draw. You start from this resonance structure, but either way, you're going to wind up with something that looks like. Like this. And so that just came to me in a dream while I was thinking about that question. Oh, yeah, you could obviously have, if it happens to be able to move in two different directions, um, you're definitely going to be able to have the same pair of, res or of electrons participating in resonance two different ways. Um, and then um, where do carbocations exist naturally? They exist a lot of places, very, very short lived. They're, re they're very common intermediate for organic reactions in biochemical reactions, less common for biochemical reactions. Um, but in organic reactions, especially, you can have them exist for a very short amount of time as part of a larger reaction mechanism. Um, so if we went to, we 
look at as a potential energy surface. Um, you can conceivably have a reaction that goes uphill in energy temporarily, make a less stable molecule for a second before then going downhill. So you, your reaction overall is downhill in energy is favorable, but we're making this less stable intermediate in the middle. And so that's where we see a lot of, a lot of our really things that we say are, well, this is really unstable, but it does exist. It usually it's in the context of it exists for a very short minute as sort of a stopover in between two more stable things. It's your it's your um, gas station and in and out in Kettleman City on I-5. In between Sacramento and LA, it's not really stable. Nobody stays there long. You move along pretty quickly, um, but it's there. Um, if not for the fact that it was in between Sacramento and LA, there would be no reason to have those gas stations in that in and out right there, right? And then last, this is not my favorite answer to give, but the answer really for the last one is not always. There's you can usually tell when there are resonance structures pretty easily, especially once you see, start seeing the patterns. Like there's that that um, that list of common re um, resonance structure patterns that was in one of our lectures from last week. Um, but it's a lot harder to look at it and determine or have like a mathematic quick mathematical um, equation to throw it in to say, well, there's going to be five resonance structures. That's a lot trickier to do. Um, because there's so many variables at play. You can't just look at the number of pi bonds because they all have to be conjugated pi bonds. And if they're conjugated pi bonds with lone pairs, you can't just count lone pairs because it depends on are they lone pairs that can participate or are they lone pairs that are stuck in one place? Um, so there's just a lot of variables. And so in general, it winds up being easier to handle it on a case-by-case -case basis than to try to come up with some all-encompassing. We can do it. Um, and if you, you know, that's the sort of question that if you gave Larry or Bruce, they'd, they'd be able to come up with some, some mathematical way of predicting it. Um, but the model and the predictions are going to wind up taking more time for you to use than just drawing them out. All right, let's talk a little bit more about acids and bases. Um, let's do a little practice. So write the reaction, the ionization of pentanoic acid and water. So here's the structure for pentanoic acid. Here, two, three, and 
prove it in the record. Go ahead. Oh, you just drew the card. I, I flew, flipped it over the other way. The only real trick with these is figuring out what the acidic proton is in a molecule that has more than one type of hydrogen, right? But there again, once again, there's patterns that when you when you know those patterns, like you know that this is a is an acid group. This, your carboxylic acid groups are always going to be more acidic protons than alkane hydrogens and pretty much anything else. Um, if we're looking to draw ionization of a molecule that didn't have an acid group on it, we would have to go back to that table of pKa's um, and kind of practice with like, okay, well, this is going to be the one that gives up its proton a little more easily. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's going to be the acid groups. So pretty, pretty straightforward when you get used to it because it always looks the same, basically. No matter what the other R group is that's attached to it, that's going to be your acidic proton. So for the second part, if the solution has a pH of 3.5 and the pKa is 4.8, is more of the acid ionized or neutral? Excess hydrogen ions in solution. Yeah, so this is one of the ones with layers, right? Where it's like, okay, we need to look at which one is neutral, ion protonated or deprotonated. Neutral is protonated for acids for this particular um, function group. So then the question really is is more of the acid protonated or deprotonated? And, and pKa is 4.8, that's our 50-50 mark, right? That's where it crosses over between being deprotonated and protonated. If the pH is 3.5, we're more acidic than 4.8. So we're more acidic than 4.8, more of it is in the protonated state. We have extra H pluses around, so we're more likely to see it in this state, which is the neutral state. Right. And this is the one where you want to pay attention to, you almost, until you get really comfortable with it, you almost always want to draw out the two forms, protonated and deprotonated, so that you can see which one's neutral and which one's ionized. Right, because protonated, without even knowing what the molecule is, all you need is a pKa, and you can say protonated and deprotonated, right? But you don't know whether it has a charge or not, unless you know whether the, what the protonated and deprotonated look like. But in general, if it's an acidic compound, an acidic compound is going to be neutral when it's protonated, generally speaking. And basic compounds are going to be neutral um, when they're deprotonated. But even so, still to this day, if I, the way that PKA tables can be written is um, in very confusing ways as well. So I still, to this day, um, if I hesitate or if I think about it, some a lot of times I'll draw out the structure just to just to reassure myself that I'm thinking about it the right way. Let's add one more layer. Here's benzoic acid. It's dissolved in a solution with a pH of 6.5, and the pKa is 4.2. Is more of the molecule going to be soluble in water or non-polar solvent under these conditions? So first off, think 
It's more of it protonated or deprotonated. And then look at it and say, okay, it's more of it ionized or neutral. And then think, okay, what does that do to my solubility? So there's three layers now. Protonated form is neutral, and that's the form we find at low pH. Our deprotonated is ionized that's going to be at high pH. Which form is going to be more soluble in water? Ionized. So our pH is above the pKa. So more of it is deprotonated, which means more of it is ionized, which means more of it is soluble in water. And we take that same solution and we acidify it like we're going to do in next week's lab and like you got a chance to see on Tuesday um, we'll wind up with it moving shifting that equilibrium to favor more of this and we'll see it be more soluble in non-polar solvent so it's a lot of steps to remember none of them are particularly difficult on their own but when you get a point blank question like this, you kind of have to go through the steps until you get really comfortable with it, right? Until you get to the point where you can visualize, I know exactly which one is the, is the deprotonated versus protonated and which one's ionized. Eventually you'll be able to do this pretty quickly in your head. Um, but, it's a little bit like doing like multiple algebra steps at the same time, right? If you try and do too many algebra steps at the same time, they can all be pretty simple, but you'll still trip yourself up. Same thing. Take your time on these, write out with your different categories, your different layers, protonated, deprotonated, neutral, ionized. When I was, when I was uh, writing some of these um, questions, I kept trying to, instead of writing neutral, I kept trying to write unionized, ionized versus unionized. Um, turns out that is a word. Spell check didn't catch me on that, except normally you pronounce it unionized. <laughs> <laughs> then I realized we already have a word for molecule that doesn't have a charge. Well, neutral. <laughs> All right, so questions on acids and bases. Yeah, when it's acids are pretty easy to recognize and get a handle on. When you start seeing molecules that have lots of formal pairs that can accept H pluses, and you start seeing bases show up as well, that's when it starts getting tricky because you've got to go back and forth um, with your with your logic. All right, so now we're going to get into what's. What everybody's first thing everybody thinks about when they think about OCHEM is 
um, naming things, right? That's probably the first thing that just about the first thing you did in Gen Chem when you got to, to your chapter on organic, right? Was here's how you name these things. Here's how you draw them. Now we have the basics down well enough, the fundamentals, so we can get into some of this. Um, so we're going to start with the simplest molecules, hydrocarbons, which is exactly what they sound like. A hydrocarbon is a molecule that is only hydrogen and carbon, which means we're very limited as to what kind of um, functional groups we can have, right? Basically, the only functional groups that we'll see uh, for hydrocarbons are going to be pi bonds or occasionally intermediates that are, you know, carbocations or something like that. Um, so all of these examples, all classified, are all classified as hydrocarbons, even though there are some different functional groups present. Um, so we can have alkenes, we can have alkynes, we can have aromatics that are all hydrocarbons. Alkanes specifically are hydrocarbons with no pi bonds. Right? And so this is a great place for us to start because it gives us a lot more practice with, okay, without too many different variables, um, let's get a lot of practice with drawing all the possible constitutional isomers. Left that alone for last week, but we're going to come back to it now. Um, but we're not going to worry about anything with pi bonds at this point. Um, or oxygens or nitrogens or, or halides. All right, so when it comes to nomenclature in, in OCHEM, um, it's a different set of rules than what we consider inorganic nomenclature, or the three types of nomenclature that you learned in Gen Chem. Right, there's covalent nomenclature, there's ionic, and then there was acids and bases, right? Um, those are all inorganic nomenclature, and they're all based just on what are, what's the overall molecular formula. Um, organic nomenclature has to be more complicated because for the same molecular formula, there's numerous different compounds and we need to differentiate between them. Um, I would throw this slide in there just because it's kind of interesting to some of the history of some common molecules. Um, and literally, they used to, whoever discovered a compound just got to make up the name for it. And so you wound up with um, formic acid. It's named after the Latin word for ant, which is formica. Because um, if you've ever, if you've ever had a bunch of ants somewhere in, and you know, maybe in your kitchen or something, if you squish a whole bunch of ants at once, it has a very, very specific smell. Um, it's kind of like, kind of like acidic, but also like sweet. That sweet acidic smell is formic acid. That's why ants are sweet. Um, when, and acidic. Um, it turns out, so insects don't actually have circulatory systems. They don't use a heart to pump um, any fluids or any oxygen around. They literally just have holes in their body that allow oxygen in. Um, and so they have a lot of different compounds than what than mammals do. Um, because they're so small, they can get away with that. Um, fun fact, that's also why insects were so large during, during the, um, the time periods when trees first evolved. Um, there, were no, there was nothing around that could digest the trees. And so you wound up with, with trees taking over, plant life taking over. Um, and then, but then when they would die, the carbon would get sequestered because there was nothing that could break down all the cellulose that was in those plants. And so you wound up with a lot less CO2 and a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere. And more higher concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere allowed insects to grow larger because they could, if there was more oxygen in the air, the, those holes as their way of getting oxygen to their insides were more effective. Um, when the amount of oxygen in the air dropped, then all of a sudden there's there's a theoretical maximum for insects, basically, where they won't get any larger than that because you need a circulatory system once enough of the body is um, inside when the volume to surface area ratio drops. Sorry, it gets too big. Um, anyway, formic acid comes from the word for, for ant. 
Um, they named the first organic compound they've ever synthesized in the lab is urea, and it was named that because they isolated it from urine. Um, morphine is named after the Greek god of dreams, which um, if you watch Sandman on Netflix, Morpheus is the main character, right? He's the, the god of dreams. Um, that comes from the ancient Greek, and that's actually where morphine gets its name. Um, and then barbiturate, I you never actually see it like that. Barbit barbiturates is the deprotonated form of barbitur barbituric acids. Um, and he named Alfred von Bayer named this compound in honor of a woman named Barbara, um, which that's as much of the story as I know, but other than the fact that his wife's name was not Barbara. <laughs> so um, I'm sure Adolf was in a bit of trouble for that one. Um, and other, there's a, com a couple very common German names that show up all the time in organic chemistry. One of them is Hoffman. There's four different Hoffmans that we're going to learn about. There's um, over the course of this of this series, when you see Hoffman, it's not always the same Hoffman. Um, and sometimes they do us a favor with the spelling. Sometimes it's H O F M A N N. And sometimes it's two F's, one N. And sometimes it's two F's, two N's. So you can kind of tell the difference. But um, Bayer is another one. Um, this Bayer is not the one who invented aspirin, but Bayer aspirin is named after a Bayer organic chemist from Germany, spelled B-A-E-Y-E-R. They dropped the first E to make it more palatable to Americans because they didn't want it looking too German um, when they were marketing it to Americans. Um, but Bayer and Hoffman show up all the time in organic chemistry. Just fun history of chemistry facts. All right, so now we get away from that. We don't want random names because nobody wants to, to deal with you know, memorizing all this, right? So our systematic names are the way we're going to name things. And the main key with these is that it has to give you an unambiguous, the name has to unambiguously let you draw the right compound. Right, that's the whole purpose with these systematic names is if you know these rules, you will always get to the right compound from the name. All right, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to continuously add new layers of nomenclature because as we add more variables, we find out, oh, um, well, this is a pretty good name, except there's two possible ways you can interpret it and they give you different molecules. So let's add another wrinkle to our nomenclature to just differentiate between those two. And the, the basic rule is you find the longest continuous carbon chain, and then you look at what functional groups are present. And from those two things, um, you're gonna get one unambiguous name. The reason I keep I keep harping on that is because there's there are a few times where you can follow our rules for systematic nomenclature and get two different names for the same compound, and both names will unambiguously get you back to the same place. There's a few plate times that that can happen, and in that case, either of those two names is fine. We don't want the opposite, where one name could give you two compounds. That's the problem. One compound giving you two names is okay though. So a lot of times the we're finding the longest continuous carbon chain um, refer to that as the parent chain or the parent molecule, um, and it's not always going to be left to right or up, up and down. Sometimes it takes a little bit of creative thought to find it or circling. I usually do it as a go by circling what I think the longest one might be. And if there's a couple options, go count them and then see if circling in a different order is gonna give you the same number or, or a bigger number. So if I'm looking at this, yeah, it looks like that looks pretty good, but then I realize, oh wait, there's two there. 
So what if I went that way instead? So I'm assuming you counted right, but just to fill it in, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Are there any other ways that we could we could count that would get us to a chain of nine or longer? I don't think so, but that's the question we're always going to ask. When you think you found the, the longest way, look at it and say, wait, well, what if I started there? Is that is that the same length or a little bit or longer, or is it shorter? It's shorter than we're already good with it, right? Um, the nice thing about these is that there's a finite number of, of ways you can do, right? So you have to start or end at, at the end of a carbon chain, right? So we think you found it. Well, I can't start there and make it any longer. I can't start there and make it any longer. I can't start there and make it any longer. I can't start here and make it any longer. So we must have found the right one. Right. And so when we're when we're naming the parent molecule, that whatever the longest continuous carbon chain is, we're just going to use that number as our base molecule. Right. And so we have a different set of, of prefixes when it comes to organic chemistry, partly to differentiate between those classic Greek and Latin prefixes, the mono, di, tri, uh, tetra. We don't want to reuse those because then it, that gets really confusing, right? And so we have a separate set of organic um, nomenclature, although there is some overlap. Um, mostly, these are the ones we want to keep distinct because those are going to be the most common other prefixes that get used on top of things. It's very rare that we would have five of the same functional group attached. To something so very rarely is pent going to get used twice in a row. Um, you know, you can't, it'd be very, very uncommon to have pentachloropentane. It's possible, um, but it's unlikely. But it's fairly common to have something like dichloroethane. And so having a separate set, especially for those low, those first four numbers, is really helpful in keeping you can keep confusing yourselves and others. Right, but once you get past butte, the rest of these are pretty standard, right? So easy to memorize from five forward. Um, I don't know how big of a ch uh, carbon chains you went through with Gen Chem. Did you go just just ten, or did you go past that? It was just ten. Yeah, we we played with the lead yes, but... Right, and that's the thing is is once you get past about ten, if it's a common molecule, then it's going to have its own common name which is usually one of those ones that the discoverer made up, right? So once you get past 10, there's not a whole, there's a whole system past that, but I don't even remember it off the top of my head. It's like moon deca or dodeca and tri-deca or things like that. Um, but we're just going to stick it through one through 10 for now. Um, and these are the ones worth memorizing, right? Meth at propute. Um, and this is a dangerous way to memorize things. Um, but I always remember that that F and meth are backward um, because F is smaller in terms of letters, but it's bigger in terms of size. Um, problem with using that as a way to remember things is that as soon as you start feeling comfortable, as soon as you get it down, you're like, wait, is that backwards? And then you're going to reverse, reverse it. Um, so watch out for that. But that is how I used to remember it. Probate and butane um, are a little bit easier because you have everyday experience with those molecules, right? Everybody's used a propane grill before to some extent, right? Um, and most people have used a, a butane lighter. Butane is bigger than propane, which is why it's more commonly found as a liquid at room temperature. Propane is smaller, therefore, it's more commonly a gas. 
Um, so you can use propane and butane to remind yourself if you get if you get hung up on those. All right, so if we want to start just drawing products, we draw a the alkane with the formula. This is a little bit of review from a couple weeks ago. Um, if we draw the alkane with the formula C3H8. Done that before. The name of the molecule, you just take the prefix and then you stick the name of the, you stick the functional group name basically at the end of it. So for these molecules, if it's an alkane we're, deal, we're building, it's just going to be propane. Probe for three, aim because it's an alkane. Right? It doesn't really get tricky until we start adding branches. It's just a little bit of um, getting to know, getting familiar with those prefixes again. So C4H10 is going to be butane. Well, maybe. Because once you get to C4H10, now we get to the point where you could have branches. You can't have branches with only three carbons, right? There's, there's not another way we can arrange these that's where the longest continuous carbon chain isn't three. But as soon as you get to four, We have two possibilities, right? So these are drawn with the 3D structures, but we could draw the the um, two methyl propane. Yeah, two methyl propane. Well, and even the two is a little bit overkill in that, right? Because there's only one place to put a methyl group on propane. Um, but either way, the longest continuous carbon chain. The process is the same. Find your longest continuous carbon chain, and if that is the whole molecule, then it's as simple as there's our longest continuous carbon chain is four, so I use butte and I stick cane on the end to get butane. We don't want two molecules, two separate molecules with the same name, though, right? That's the whole point of this systematic nomenclature. <clears throat> so we don't want the same name here. I'm going to switch to the red so you can see it against that structure. So no matter where we start counting, our longest continuous carbon chain here is going to be three. So our parent molecule, our base molecule, is going to be propane again. So now it's propane with a branch. And the way we indicate those branches Anything, and this is one of the reasons I like to circle the parent molecule, is because anything that sticks out from that, that part that I circled, we have to name as a branch. We have to name it as, um, as something attached to our parent molecule, which is sometimes called a substituent, um, which is... A substituent is a is a less important part of the molecule or something that's substituted on in place of something else. So if we have a branch, if it's a simple alkane branch, then all we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to add YL. Um, and that's going to indicate that it's an alkane branch. And then we just put the same prefix that we would normally use to say how big that branch is. So this is a single carbon branch. So it's a methyl propane. In, uh, in 103, how did, how did you guys handle um, adding the prefix? Did you make this all one word? That, lazy, but... <laughs> the um that's kind of the 
The textbook way of doing it is to say that you all of this is supposed to be one word. With methylpropane, that's still relatively easy to see what you're saying, but it, it results in, as we get to more complicated cases, it gets really, really hard to keep track of what's going on when you smoosh it all together. Um, so I'm a big fan of using hyphens to sort of separate out. You don't want to use a space. There's a specific reason for that when we talk about esters. There's sometimes when adding a space tells you something else. Um, but just so that you can keep track of um, where the branches are, where the parent molecule is, if you have multiple, multiple branches separating things out, I like using the hyphens as well, um, rather than just smushing it all together. Um, however, that's a peculiarity for me. If you go take OCHEM somewhere else, they might feel strongly about it the other way. Um, and all I can say is go, go with what, go with what whoever is grading your papers tells you to do. Um, but I just want you to be aware of that. All right, so here's the complete structures for the two that we just did, our butane and our methylpropane. Um, this is just writing out the same thing. So constitutional isomers have the same formula but different structures, therefore they must have different names. So here's some more practice with branch alkanes. Prefixes, I don't know why they chose to do them before the parent molecule. It seems like it would make more sense to put your parent molecule up front and then add your modifiers to the end. But for whatever reason, that's not usually how English works. Right? We tend to add our adjectives before the noun instead of after the noun. So they kind of did the same thing with the, with the IUPAC names. Your parent molecule is always at the very end, and anything you, any prefixes you add before that are modifying the parent molecule. Um, and English is really funny with the way adjectives work because you you would you put the adjectives after the noun if you have like a conjunction in there. So we could say propane with a methyl group but it's methylpropane. You put the adjective before when you're making it all one object, but if you're adding a conjunction in there, you're allowed to put the adjective afterwards, um, which I'm sure that, that Julie or some of the other English teachers here could, could help us understand that. Um, I've got a good, uh, not really a joke, but the thing that you never knew you knew about English if you're a native English speaker that I'll find um, during uh, during break here in a minute. Um, anyway, still find the longest continuous carbon chain. In this case, it's five for this example. So that tells us our base molecule is going to be pentane. And then we add the prefix to indicate the size of the side chain or the branch. So methyl. Pentane. Once you get past butane, when you add a methyl group to something, you will need to be to be specific though, because if necessary, you need to describe where that branch is located. Right. So this that's what you were doing on the last one, Zeke. You said two methyl propanes. Well, we do we really need the two? Not for for propane or butane, right? For propane or butane, there's only one place where you can put a methyl group. But for pentane, there are two possibilities, right? You put it there or you can put it here. And so we just start counting from the lowest possible. We want to keep the number as low as possible. But, but yeah, we just use it a what's called a low camped. Is kind of the, the fancy word for use a number to say where it is. Um, they don't just say number though, because there are locants that aren't numbers. When we start getting into amines, you can have a branch attached to a nitrogen. And so you and then in that case, N is the locant. So if you had something like A 
a cyclohexane with a nitrogen attached. That's cyclohex cyclohexanamine. And it has a branch, and that branch is on an N, not on any of the carbons. So we'd say that that's N-methyl cyclohexanamine. But if the branch was here, that would be 2-methyl cyclohexanamine. Right, so the, the flow can't doesn't have to be a number. Was just was the point there. That's why they use this weird fancy word for it um, instead of just saying what number of carbon is it on, because there will come a time where we we can get more complicated with that. All right, just for practice, visualizing these. And seeing in 3D and trying to find the large, longest continuous carbon chain in 3D. We already did the one on the left, right? Correct. There's our methyl propane. So then here, do this one first. There's our longest continuous carbon chain, it's five once again. So that's going to be a pentane, and it's got a methyl group. So it's methyl pentane, but it's two methyl pentane now. The one we just did was three methyl pentane. And then here, how many? What's our longest continuous carbon chain for this one? Okay. So it's still going to be pentane. Three ethyl. Ethyl because the branch is two carbons long. Um, when it comes to counting carbons on a branch, go with the tree analogy that the branch suggests, right? The branch starts where it, where it differs from the tree from the tree trunk, right? So that doesn't count as part of the branch because that's already part of the tree trunk. People sometimes want to start counting there and say, well the branch is three carbons long. No the branch is what starts outside of the trunk. So three ethyl and The other reason, there's one more reason why I like the um, defaulting to using the hyphens is that when you start typing these or running out of room on your paper, you're going to want to write the names in two lines anyways a lot of the time, so you might as well already be used to using the hyphens. Um, just because it's a pretty common issue. All right. That part's simple enough so far. Um, and we'll keep adding wrinkles to it. Let's take our break. Let's do 10 minutes. Let's come back and hit at 11. And we'll do some more practice. Get this ingrained so you can't possibly mix up if you broke ever again.
Yeah. Um, I would do the one here. So 530-541-4660. That's extension 704. Typically, when they're following up with these, they'll they might call. I this is just for the for tutoring, right? Yeah. So I'm yeah. not knows how to get it. Yeah. So <laughs> use that one. You said uh, six seven four seven zero four seven zero. Yeah. I would get confused with that one because I dial my wife's extension a lot more often than I dial my own extension. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Five three zero. Uh, five four one. Four six six zero. Seven zero four. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. No worries. Did you guys say chemistry professor? Yeah. This is what you are.
dividing, which was weird before when we were talking about how you have to put the adjectives before the noun. Not only do you have to put the adjectives before the noun, you have to put the adjectives in a certain order before the noun. Um, turns out there's, there's another one there. Um, if you if you have these uh, more than one adjective, putting the adjectives in the wrong order makes it sound weird to native English speaker. It has to go quantity, opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, slash material, qualifier, then the noun. If you mix that up, it sounds weird. So like one beautiful old brick house, one brick beautiful old house. That doesn't make any sense, right? You do that without thinking about it because we're native English speakers. Um, but it has to go in this, if you mess with this, it changes what you're actually inferring. Um, a wool new button down sweater, putting new in the middle of your adjectives is, whoa, what just happened? Um, there was one, but this one. So you have a, a lovely little old rectangular green French silver whittling knife. <laughs> but if you switch any of those words, it's weird. Um, and None of us are sorry, and size comes before color, so you can have a great green dragon, but you can't have a green great dragon. And then I like, I just like the way this one looked, um, and it has some more examples wild, large, furry, young, pear shaped, grayish white Japanese teacup poop. A teacup at the beginning, and it's, it's a teacup wild, large, furry. I was I thought that was really interesting the first time I saw that. So so great. <laughs> now you're thinking about it too hard. <laughs> you blame me for your English phone classes when they start wondering why your writing went down hell when you started taking out yeah. <laughs> All right. We have easier rules to follow in organic chemistry when it comes to more than one branch. Um, although it still does get a little complicated. Um, except we're just going to keep adding prefixes. If we have more than one modifier that needs to be added, more than one branch, we just add more than one prefix. Um, if you have branches that are the same length, then we say that's when we start adding dye, try. So you can have dimethyl triethyl just means that that parent molecule has three ethyl groups attached to it. So for this molecule right here, our longest continuous carbon chain, it's five, so it's still gonna be pentane. Now we have two branches. We have a methyl and an ethyl. And in theory, the most correct way to do it is to put the prefixes alphabetically, but I'll talk about why that doesn't always work um, and why I'm not gonna be picky about that in a second. But as long as it's a simple case like this, we have an ethyl group and a methyl group. Um, so we're, we'll put ethyl first. So three ethyl, to methyl pentane. We specify where each of those are. They, they carry their locant with them. So that way you know that three goes with the ethyl and two goes with the methyl. You put all of the numbers at the beginning, it'd be impossible to know whether three was for the ethyl or the methyl, right? Or at least it'd be a lot harder when you still come up with some system like they go in order or something like that, that that would still be really, really tricky to follow. Um, the reason I'm not that picky about alphabetically is because working OCHEM textbooks don't agree on what happens if you add dye to methyl. Do you alphabetize it under D or under M? Um, different textbooks handle that differently. So as a result, I'm not going to be picky about it. And that doesn't affect whether it's an unambiguous name, right? 
doesn't matter what order you put these in, you're still able to draw the same molecule. So I'm not going to worry about that. But that said, with, with the quizzes and the canvases auto grader, um, if you put them in the order that's not the order I put it in, you'll get marked wrong initially. And then when I go back through and regrade, um, I'll give you full credit for it, if, as long as that's warranted. Um, but yeah, so if anytime you've got two of the branches that are the same length, you just indicate that by saying di, diethyl, dimethyl, um, tetra, you can have tetramethyl. And you can go beyond that. Um, then you start just you start using those same prefixes like we've used before. So if that ethyl group was a methyl group, then it would be two, three, dimethyl. Correct. So let's draw that one. Our parent molecule is still pentane as two methyl groups as branches. So we're going to say dimethyl. And then we have to specify where each of them are. So we would say one of our methyls is on carbon two, the other one is on carbon three. Typically, we separate them with a comma. Um, again, it's one of, um, just to differentiate you, you offset your locants from the branch with the hyphen. So you don't want to use a hyphen in between the two numbers because then it would get confusing. So we use commas in between the numbers and then hyphens to separate the numbers from the rest of the name. Um, where people tend to get bogged down or tend to miss things is if you say dimethyl or trimethyl or whatever, you need to specify where every single one of those is, unless there's only one possible place it could be. So like if you had hexachloroethane, there's only six places for chlorines to go. Therefore, you don't need to specify where all six chlorines are on the ethane, right? Um, but for whatever reason, I guess it's not for whatever reason. I totally understand this. If you put them on the same carbon, people have the tendency to just write three dimethyl. You need to specify where both of them are specifically, so it would be three, three dimethyl. Even if they're attached to the same carbon, you specify what both of them are. If you say di, I need three numbers in front of it. You say tri, or sorry, if you say di, I need two numbers in front of it. Say tri, I need three numbers in front of it. Right, that's your, um, your rule of thumb with those locants and those prefixes. Will there ever be a reply? Tetra, if there's four. Um, yes, and actually, so that's a, um, the one that comes to mind is a molecule that we use in, um, we use it for um, NMR. Uh, that's why. Um, tetramethyl silane. I know. Why doesn't it read my mind? Right? Um, so tetramethyl silane is a little bit weird because it's got a silicon in the middle instead of a carbon, but it's a silicon. Silane is just SiH4, so methane except with a silicon instead of a carbon. So tetramethyl silane just means you have you have three methyl groups attached instead of the hydrogens attached. Um, so yeah, we do, we do see tetra, see, especially when we get into like ring structures, you can pretty easily have, if you've got a six-sided ring, you pretty easily have, you know, 
tetramethylcyclohexane. Um, and then you would just specify where all four of them are. It's the same process, though, it just gets longer. There's one more practice. What's your longest continuous carbon chain? So this one's just go left to right, you get five. Count there, you get five. Start at the bottom. Yeah, it's got two branches, they're both methyls. Um, and this is why we say methyl, rather than just say how many carbons there are, you know, what, rather than just use the condensed structure or something like that. Um, the other thing that confuses people sometimes is the idea that this is two separate branches that are each one carbon, that a dimethyl on the same, on the same carbon is not the same as an ethyl carbon. It seems like it'd be really similar, right? Because it's both two carbons is branch from the main group, right? But it's two small branches rather than one larger branch. Uh, it's an easy place to get tripped off. But yeah, it would just be three, three, dimethyl, hexane. All right, and just as a as a side note, when you see things like we used in um, in lab the other day, we used hexanes plural. It was just a bottle that said hexanes. Um, typically, that means it's a bunch of constitutional isomers that all have the same molecular weight, um, and so they all have a total of six carbons. But they can be it's kind of a mixture of all the different constitutional isomers. So. Um, in that case, it was, you know, methyl, methyl pentane, dimethyl butane, straight chain hexane, um, are all just sort of mixed together. They all have really simple boiling points. And so rather than when you go through the process of distilling molecules out of, uh, crude petroleum is where a lot of our feedstock for chemicals comes from right now still, um, rather than separate all of those out. If you're just using it as a solvent or you're just using it um, as, you know, as a fuel source, it doesn't really matter which constitutional isomers you have. It matters what, what temperature they burn at, what temperature they boil at, and what's their solubility, right? And so a lot of times you'll just see like a, a plural thrown on there, butane from, um, in, your, in your lighter, it's probably a mixture of butane and methylpropane because why bother you separating it out if you're just going to burn it? Gasoline is the same way. Gasoline is a mixture of organic molecules um, that all have similar boiling points and similar energy when you burn them. It's not one molecule, um, which is why you can get different octane ratings. The different octane ratings is literally like, okay, comparing this to straight chain octane, eight carbons in a row, this particular mixture has 87% the energy of pure octane or 91% the energy of pure, pure octane. Hmm. Um, but it's the same thing where it's, it's just a bunch of stuff mixed together and they just normalize it and say, okay, compare, this is our gold standard for, for standard internal combustion engines. So we're just gonna compare everything to octane. Um, and really just burn whatever, like in theory, you could actually take that bottle of hexanes that we used in lab, you can dump it in your, in your gas tank. Hexanes are pretty close to octane of about 85 to, to 90. A nice research for you too. Um, but like to say, it would be more, more just like if you have a fuel source, if, like if we use them once as a solvent and we were just gonna dump them into a waste, in theory, you could just take that waste and, and instead of it just evaporating or letting it go to the um, to the dump, you can take it and just use it as fuel if you're going to be driving your car around anyway. Um, 
modern cars can be a little picky about that and old, old cars can be a little picky about that. Um, as far as having water content or you know, needing to be above a certain level. But in theory, that's all gasoline is. It's just hydrocarbons that burn pretty well um, and have similar boiling points. I was told in my auto shop class that the octane rating is a spectrum of not indicator or something like that. Which is that, probably just some bullshit that they pulled out of their ass. That might be, they might have evolved into that. Where it was originally designed, why we would call it octane, and why octane is usually on a, it seems like a percentage would make a lot of sense, right? Because it's always in the 80s and 90s. Right. You can get stuff, fuel that is more than 100 octane, um, but it's like if you try putting jet fuel in your car, jet fuel has more than 100 octane. Right. Um, because it has to be more energy dense because you're flying with it instead of just rolling. Um, but the, so the knock indicator I, that wouldn't have come into play until they started introducing unleaded gas, I believe. Okay. And I think the octane rating predates that. Um, but I'm not sure. I didn't take very many mechanical engineering classes, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know the historical significance and where it came from. I mean, you what, what it means I now, know. I don't know. Yeah, you can go well, well, I'll, I'll probably do that over the weekend. <laughs> Spend some time on Wikipedia. Um, allergens also get indicated with a prefix. It's not a YL prefix, prefix though. Um, for the most part, it's just an O. You just go the first two syllables of your halogen. So instead of bromine, it becomes bromo, chlorine is chloro, fluorine is fluoro, iodine is iodo, which sounds weird, but that's the right way. It's like hydroiodic acid, right? Looks really weird when you write it out, but that's the right name. Um, and these ones we also need locants for, right? Anytime you're specifying that you have two branches, they count as branches attached. They're just not carbon branches. So for this first one, I don't want to write that down. Here's our long continuous carbon chain. If we have a choice as to which end of the molecule we're going to call carbon one, we pick the side that gives us the lowest overall numbers for our locants. So this one would be two chloro, three methyl. This one on the top right, it doesn't really matter which of these you pick as your carbon as part of your, your primary carbon chain because it gives you the same number either way, right? And occasionally, when we do that, when we start getting um, these larger molecules, there's sometimes there's an easy way and a hard way, but they both give you the same parent molecule. Which case there's not there, that's the case of it's both right, um, but you might as well pick one that makes it easier to name. But the picking the other way is not wrong. Um, it's just more complicated. So for this one, it's still six carbon, so it's still going to be hexane, but it's going to be two bromo, five methyl. I think halogens or other functional groups is about the only way that you can 
that you need to use locants or that you can have branches on really small molecules because you can't add a methyl group to ethane, right? You try to add methyl group to, to ethane, you just get propane. But if you add chlorines, our longest continuous carbon chain is still two. So that's going to be ethane. Just going to be dichloroethane. And if you say di, you need to specify where both of them are. And ethane is sort of specified too. You would think, but because you they could be on the same carbon. Okay. So if they were on the same carbon, it would be one one dichloroethane. Here, because they're on the opposite carbons, it's one two dichloroethane. We could have it our own way of saying like on adjacent carbons or on different carbons, but we already have the number system in place. So don't fix it if it ain't broken. Three carbons, so propane. So technically, for this one, the methyl doesn't need a locant, but the fluoro does. When we start getting into these more French cases, it's always better to be overly specific than under specific, right? So if you're unsure if you need to add a number, add the number. Clear this real quick so I have broken. So it's three carbons, so it's propane. One fluoro. Or this metal. Technically, the metal should probably go after the fluoro, but again, I'm not going to be picky about that. You know, I tend to add them from right to left. So, so I start with the parent molecule and then move this way. Um, so I just leave myself enough room to put the methyl after the floral. And again, I'm not going to be picky about that. If you're unsure, so there's because it's a methyl group, there's only one place it can be. It has to be on carbon too. Um, when you start getting these longer named molecules, it's a little bit harder to keep track of that sometimes. And so if you did this, that's a smaller deduction if you add the number and you don't need it, than if you don't add the number if you did need it. Right? Being overly specific can make you look like you don't know what you're talking about, but at least nobody can misunderstand you. It's one of those things that like, you know, a professional chemist might say, why would you put two methyl? They wouldn't say that out loud, but they're like, oh, it's another OCHEM undergrad student um, giving, you know, writing me this name. Um, but that's not the worst thing in the world, to be overly specific, to be a little bit redundant. So what would be more important as far as number systems or alphabetical orders? So should I let one go first? Um, the alphabetical is the one. That, so you would put fluoro or methyl, regardless of their numbers. You want to sound, start counting from the side that keeps the numbers as low as possible, but the numbers, don't think of those as terms of counting, they're just telling you where that branch is. Um, so don't think about that. But again, I'm not gonna get picky on that. As long as the two goes with the methyl and the one goes with the fluoro, and you don't put the wrong locant on the wrong branch, I'm not gonna get picky. And we see pretty quickly how even with just, just one functional group and alkanes, you can get pretty complicated names pretty quickly, right? Uh, especially if you have them, it looks really, really written as condensed structure too. Um, but this, I like this figure partly because it reiterates what I was saying before about how condensed structures were, are condensed structures they're still around because it made it way easier to type on a typewriter. Um, because especially if you have a vertical line in a typewriter, right? 
No, nobody has the lines on a typewriter that are 120 degrees from each other. Um, but this allowed it to be typed without needing new typographical um, you know, plates, what do they call those? This typeset, yeah, pieces, pile plates, I think. Either way, um, just so you've seen it, the process is still the same. Find your longest continuous carbon chain. But this gets us into what happens when your longest continuous carbon chain means that you wind up with something where the branch has a branch. So you two had Carl, Nikki had Carl for OCHEM. Um, did you guys use isopropyl or anything like that? In Gen Chem, did you cover naming any of this stuff? A little bit. A little bit. Did you get to isopropyl? Did you guys? Um, I don't like that system because it relies on more memorization. Uh, it's the old school way of doing things. I'm going to wipe this out so I can draw it. Anytime you've got a molecule where your branch itself has a branch, there's a couple ways you can name that. Sometimes, though, you can actually get away with just counting different. Like on this molecule I just drew, if you count from left to right, you get six, right? You can get six. You count down, start counting down here, too. So sometimes they can get in one of those complicated branches. All that means is, well, if, I, if you look a little bit differently, there might be a way to turn one complicated branch into two simple branches. Um, sometimes there's not a way to do that. For instance, if I add one more carbon there, now our longest continuous carbon chain is seven and it has to go left to right. And so in that case, our parent molecule is going to be heptane. And the old school way of naming these complicated branches used another set of prefixes like iso um, and or terp or sec or n with the different ways, different prefixes to indicate whether it was a straight chain, N meant it was a straight chain, so you could have an N propyl group, or you could have an isopropyl group, which is what this is. N propyl group would be one, two, three, three carbons as a branch in a straight chain. Isopropyl group is three carbons as a branch, but you're connected in the middle of that branch. I don't particularly like that because especially once you get past propyl, it gets really, really hard to tell whether, okay, is that an isopental group or is that a secpental group or is that, there's really, really weirdness happens. Um, so what I'm gonna teach you instead is a little bit trickier for the smallest complicated branches, um, but it's universal, it's the same process every time. And all it is, is using parentheses, pretty much the same way you would use parentheses in a math class. Parentheses in math means do this first, right? Or these things apply to each other, and then you apply other stuff to them, right? In this case, you would say this, the, the branch that's attached here, the longest branch that's attached is an ethyl group. And then there's a methyl group attached to the ethyl group. So the way we would write that is in parentheses, we say methyl ethyl. So the parentheses are telling you that methyl applies to the ethyl, not to the heptane. You see how that's similar to, to parsing out something in, in a math equation, say these two things go together, and then there's the rest of the math. Can you see it as like parentheses in parentheses? You, you can even have parentheses within parentheses, yeah. Um, 
But then once you have this in parentheses, this methyl ethyl group is the same thing as saying an isopropyl group. So isopropyl, if you've seen that first, isopropyl is a common prefix, gets used all over the place. Everybody's seen isopropyl alcohol, right? Um, that's really common to think of this group, that style of branch as an isopropyl. And it's a little bit less writing even. But the thing is, if you get used to using the prefixes, are they a parentheses? That will never let you down and it's less memorization once you learn how to do it. And so I always get somebody who had either had Carl or somebody else as a taught them, drilled in the difference between isopropyl or secbutyl or iso, isobutyl or terbutyl. If you want to use those, that's fine. Um, but there are going to be times when you're going to need to use the parentheses anyway. So you might as well get used to them and just abandon this for the most part. Um, don't fall into the sunken cost fallacy. Just because you spent time to memorize it before doesn't mean it will continue to be a good investment to spend time using that system. So it's the core, just the Right, thank you. So we put it outside the parentheses. Occasionally, you can have a complicated branch where you wind up with a locant inside. That's the inside. Right. Um, so, So let's say we have a cyclooctane. We haven't done cyclos yet, but just for the sake of, um, and then I can make my branch just because I want to without it taking over and being the main group anymore. If we had, Two complicated branches attached to the same group. The red one, we're going to, for both of them, we can use parentheses. It's both, both of them are going to be a propyl group with a methyl attached to it, right? The one, one, the methyl, so I guess we start by writing it's methyl propyl. Blue one, the methyl is attached to carbon one of the branch. So we would say it's one methyl propyl. The red one is also a methyl propyl. One, two, three. But now that's on carbon two of the branch. You basically, you start counting carbons over again for the branch when you're in the parentheses. The numbers inside the parentheses are referring to the propyl branch. So carbon one of the propyl branch is right here. So we would say that's two methyl propyl. And then our overall molecule, and again, we haven't talked about cyclo groups, but it's and then we would put numbers outside the parentheses to indicate okay, and it doesn't really matter which one of these we call carbon one, six of one, half a dozen of the other, it's gonna be one three either way. But you can say one, three. One, one methyl propyl, three, two methyl propyl, cyclooctane. So the, the length of the name starts getting ridiculous pretty quickly. And the number of layers that we're thinking in can get a little bit tricky. But 
The nice thing about this is it's the same rules every time, right? No matter how complicated molecule we look, we're looking at, the same process. So yeah, could we, if we were going to deal with this molecule every day, if we were a research group and this was the molecule we were studying for the next year, we probably wouldn't call it this whole name every time we talked about it, right? In-house, we would have our own name for it. Um, and that like, we might, if I was just making up a common name for this off the top of my head, dimethylpropyl cyclooctane, and then condense that further, I mean, DMPCO or something like that. PC13. Or, good question. <laughs> the problem with that is that you never count into or out of a ring. So it's either the ring is the parent molecule or one of these branches is the parent molecule. Okay. And so since eight is bigger than four or four or three in this case, um, eight would be the parent molecule. But good thinking. Um, we just hadn't covered cyclos yet. All right, so anytime carbons are in a cyclic structure, it's still all carbons and hydrogens. It's still a hydrocarbon, still no pi bonds, so it's still an alkane. We just indicate that it's in a ring structure by throwing cyclo in front. And like we just said, if you happen to have branches, that was a CH3. That's not seven carbons in a row, even though, yeah, you can start here and count seven carbons without double counting. The fact that the, we're going to call the ring its own thing. So you never count into the ring or out of the ring. We've got a cyclohexane with a methyl. Um, the only time you would and even this is not counting into the ring or out of the ring. That's a that's a hard no. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because I just frequently forget to say that. And then on the quiz, somebody will do that and I'll have to remind it next. Um, if you happen to have, let's see, one, two, three. We have two different options for what our parent molecule is, right? But are still our same regular rule. We either have seven in a row here, or we have a ring with five. So our longest continuous carbon chain is going to be the seven. And so we, our parent molecule would be heptane. That just means that our ring is a branch. So we would just say cyclopentyl heptane. And we just specify where the cyclopentyl group is, right? So cyclo as a prefix can get thrown in anywhere, wherever wherever we need to to indicate we have a ring structure. Correct. Specify where it's attached, and, the, and a cyclo group can be attached to carbon one. Right, because that we can't count into or out of the carbon chain or out of the ring. So you could have one cyclopentylheptene. In this case, be three cyclopentylheptene. But if there was another one, let's say attached over here. Yeah. So now it's going to be dicyclopentyl. And we want to keep we want to keep the numbers as low as possible. So it could be three three seven or one five. One five dicyclopentyl heptane. It's a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of layers. But again, we're just going to keep practicing and get more and more comfortable because it's the same thing every time. And then the only thing that's ever going to change with our nomenclature is. Occasionally, we add a new ring, we add a new functional group. Maybe instead of just halogens and ring structures and alkanes, maybe we'll add an alcohol in there. And that's just one, typically, that's just going to be a, um, a new suffix that we put at the end of, of our parent molecule. 
but once you get the consider this the regular rules, you can call that the grammar. We add a little bit new vocabulary by adding new functional groups, but the rules for the grammar don't change, right? So I know this is a lot right now and a lot of, of wrinkles. We're going to get better and better at that, and it's going to get to the point where that we're spending we spend one slide on nomenclature when we introduce a new functional group because you're already so good at the basics. Um, adding one new suffix is not going to change things really, right? Uh, and this is what we were just talking about. If the cyclo group is the longest carbon chain, then you just name it as normal ethyl cyclopentane. We don't need a locant in this case because wherever our ethyl group is attached, we want it to be the lowest number possible, right? So wherever our ethyl group is attached is carbon one, since all five of these are functionally identical carbons. It doesn't really matter what we say is one and what we say is five. So we don't really need a locant because that's a given. If we have two branches on the same ring, now we need to specify a locant. Um, and again, just pick your number, your carbon one, however you want to keep the, the numbers as low as possible. So let's practice. And if you've never tried to draw a seven-sided ring by hand, um, it's very hard to make it look at anything close to the natural. Um, there is a trick to it, though. Draw the bottom half of an octagon, then the top half of a hexagon, and then you connect them. <laughs> Biggest story. Um, not typically. And the metric I use is this if somebody who's taken an OCHEM before can look at what you wrote and know what you meant, which does involve me making a judgment call. But if you're close, then no, I'm not going to ding you on it. Like the probably the most common one, I'm guessing you switched the O and the U on Flory. I didn't even put a U. Didn't even put a U. Um, <laughs> But that's still something that somebody who had taken this class would be able to look at what you wrote and knew what, know what you meant, even if you misspelled it, right? Um, if you put fluorite instead of fluoro or did something weird like that or left out the L, now all of a sudden, like, leaving out the L, fluoro makes it a whole other thing, right? Whether or not that's a thing that actually exists, somebody might look at that. I have no idea what fluoro is. Um, that I might mark up. 
I usually get that question when we do the um, the elements quiz in Chem 101, right? Because everybody's like, how, how am I going to remember how to spell praseodymium? <laughs> um, just don't leave off the whole syllable and get close so that the average person could figure out what you meant, and that's good enough. Don't leave off the syllable. Don't leave off the whole syllable. Uh, and don't, like, the other example I use is um, if you were trying to write zinc and you sw swapped out the L by the uh, Z for an L, that's not zinc anymore. I don't know what that is, but it's not zinc, right? Like, that's a, just a one letter transposition, but that's an important. Yeah. Some letters are more of it than others. Yeah. All right. For the cyclohexane, we have two methyls and an ethyl attached. So it's going to be, and you can wait. A lot of times, what I'll do when I'm writing out the, the uh, prefixes um, or the branches is I'll wait to add, I'll just leave space for the locants and I won't add them until I'm done writing. That way I can consider where I want to put my numbers. Again, this is a classic case of. Is that alphabetically correct or isn't it? And that depends on which textbook you're using. So I'm not going to be picky. Um, if you put ethyl dimethyls, just as much as correct. Um, and with all of them being alkane branches, they're all the same sort of priority. We'll define priority more detail later. Um, so just keep the numbers overall as low as possible. So if we said one, two, Four. That's lower than one, one, three, four. Um, so it would make more sense. Usually, we'd say one, two, dimethyl, four, ethyl. It gets a little bit trickier when you start adding other functional groups in, um, because it turns out the other functional groups usually have to higher priority. Um, which means you care more about keeping their numbers low than you do keeping the carbon branches low. So for this one, if it was, do that one example and then I'll. If we had this molecule, that's fluorodimethyl cyclohexane. When it comes to how we would number that, typically we want to keep the fluorine as low as possible. Even though there's two methyl groups, the fact that they're just alkanes, and alkanes are like our, sort of our, our baseline. If you have anything that's not alkane, it's more important than the alkane part. So with that in mind, we usually say it's one fluoro three three dimethyl. But again, if you got those numbers backwards, it's you would still get to the same molecule either way, right? So it's not that big of a deal. There are some functional groups that have to be on carbon one because by definition, they're at the end of a carbon chain, like an acid group, in which case that's always carbon one because the acid group has to be at the end of a carbon chain and it's more important than any other function group we might have. So in that case, like, well, I just want to get you familiar with the idea of the priority when it comes to the numbering. With, with alkanes and halogens, they're all relatively close to the same priority, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but we will start considering that as we go forward. Um, and this might just be the way my brain works, but I always found it really easy, a lot easier to go from the name to the structure than the other way around. Structure to the name, you have to remember every detail the whole way through, right? Name to structure, unless I gave you a bad name, then there's already, it's already got all the rules that you need built into the name, right? You just have to remember what they mean sometimes. Um, That said, that's a that good test taking strategy too on this class is um, when you're doing, um, you, there's usually going to be a nomenclature section on this on these tests. Um, use the test against itself. I would always try and name these, and then I'd go to to the draw the molecules from the name part and see if that rung any bells. If I'm like, oh, 
I got to go back into my other ones because I totally forgot about I have to have three numbers instead of just one number in front of in front of every fix. I use this to jog your memory and go back and fix or add anything that you might have forgotten up above. Um, I always consider like part of it is you have to have a decent memory or you know be able to keep in in the back of your head what's going on. Um, but even on standardized tests, sometimes the test itself will give you a clue if you know how to like, oh, shoot, I totally forgot about that detail that they mentioned in question nine. I'm going to go back to question two and fix it. Use the test against itself. It may even be the same. Might even be the same question sometimes or the same molecule or yeah. you know, reverse of the same thing. That's what Carl did. Points that I didn't have to do work. There you go. <laughs> right. So that's. If you can recognize things like that, if you know that that the think of it from the perspective of the test writer, um, a lot of times that will give you clues and remind you about some of these these trickier rules. Uh, so methyl ethyl cyclopentane, draw a pentagon, right, and stick a methyl ethyl group somewhere on it. One one three trichlorocyclohexane. Draw a hexagon and then add chlorines to it. There's three chlorines. Hmm. Good job, Hubert. Sometimes you can force it back down, right? <laughs> Not today, I sneeze. Unless this is class. <laughs> Tend to be uh, the top chlorine should be down. Um, but, or else it doesn't matter. One, three, three. Only if you are thinking about starting counting like a clock, right? If this is carbon one, that could be two, and that could be three, or that could be three. Right. So unless it was, if it was one, three, five trichloro, they would have to go on opposite sides. But it's one, one, three, so either of these could be carbon three. All right. So quiz this weekend, I'll relink all the images so we should work. Maybe some nomenclature, probably nothing uh, on the super tricky end, maybe one that's a, you know, a branch within a branch. Um, but, and then um, some acid-based questions, what's more soluble at this pH, like we practiced at the beginning. And so low stress, not that tricky. Let's get some practice on these, not on the nomenclature. And then we'll start talking about the behavior of alkanes and then add some new wrinkles to their structures and stuff when we uh, come back on Tuesday. Okay. Have a good weekend, everybody.